Welcome to the Daily Word for the season of Advent. Today's reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 6b to 8, 18 and 21b to the end. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation may spring up, and let it cause righteousness to sprout up also. I, the Lord, have created it. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens. He is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it a chaos. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Saviour. There is no one besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, a righteousness and strength. All who were incensed against him shall come to him and be ashamed. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall triumph and glory. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord, our Sovereign Saviour. Though the wider context of Isaiah 45 is obscured by the selective edits of the daily lectionary, it is important for us to recognize that today's verses come as part of a prophetic prediction made by Isaiah about Cyrus the Great around 150 years before his rise to power on the world stage. Because predicting the rise and specific actions of a great world leader and even addressing that leader by name, as the Lord does in chapter 44, verse 28, and chapter 45, verse 1, 150 years in advance would be evidence of astonishing supernatural knowledge. Many have sought to explain it away. Since the 19th century, German critical scholars and their protégés in liberal theology have proposed that, far from being evidence of supernatural knowledge of the future, such predictive passages are evidence of multiple anonymous authors adding to the book over the course of 250 years. In other words, they argue, the book of Isaiah contains no divinely revealed predictions about the future. Rather, later authors posing as the prophet Isaiah and writing in his voice recorded what was happening in their own time and made it seem like a prophetic prediction to make the Lord seem powerful. Now you can decide for yourself whether such innovative readings are both warranted by the evidence of the text and faithful to the divine author of scripture, but I would suggest that such modern interpretations cut directly against the argument of Isaiah 45. For in our reading, the Lord declares that behind and above and through all the events of world history, he is the one in complete control, and his purpose is the salvation of his people. So let's think about that. 
First, the Lord is in complete control of world history. If you were an observer in the ancient Near East in Cyrus's day, it would not have been obvious that the Lord was in control of anything at all. The people of Israel had been in exile for decades, working as slaves. The temple of the Lord in Jerusalem was a pile of rubble. Few gods would have seemed weaker than the Lord. But we read in verses 6 to 8 and verse 18, the Lord's reminder to Cyrus that he is the one who spoke the universe into existence. He created light and darkness, heaven and earth, and all things in between. There are no rival gods. There are no alternative authorities. Verse 7 says, He makes both well-being and disaster. Whatever happens, He is the ultimate cause. Now what a surprise that would have been for Cyrus, the pagan emperor, and those watching his rise to power. Because Cyrus fought the battles, Cyrus planned the policies, Cyrus held the wealth, but it was the Lord who pulled the strings. Whatever his own motivations and actions were, Cyrus had been named by the Lord 150 years in the past and raised to power by the Lord in the present for precisely one reason, to bring about the will of the Lord in the future. Cyrus's heart was merely a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and the Lord would direct him where he wanted him to go. Now, whether we recognize him or not, and certainly Cyrus did not, the Lord is in complete control of world history. Which leads us to the second main point of today's reading. If the Lord is in complete control, what on earth is he doing? Well, secondly, the Lord's purpose is to bring about the salvation of his people. Now again, as an outside observer in the ancient Near East in Cyrus' day, this would not have been obvious. If anything, it seemed like the people of Israel had been destroyed and not saved. The decades in exile were not a refreshing holiday. But in verses 21 to 25, we see that the Lord's purpose for his people was the same in Cyrus's day as it had been at the height of Solomon's kingdom, and as it would be down through to this very day, the Lord is saving his people. So when the Lord, who controls all things, brings about pleasant events and circumstances, it's for the salvation of his people. And when the Lord, who controls all things, brings about disastrous events and circumstances, it is for the salvation of his people. Whatever the circumstances are, God's purpose for his people, the church, is always salvation. What the Lord declared to Cyrus is what he declares to you and to the ends of the earth. Turn to me and be saved. When you recognize that he has orchestrated all the events of world history to bring you together with all his people to bow the knee and to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will know the Lord as your triumph and your glory. Let us have a time of reflection. Whether the Lord's discipline is resting heavy upon you today, or his blessing is being poured out on you and your family, do you recognize that his purpose is to bring you to salvation in Christ? How would it change the way you tell your own story if you believed that, like Cyrus, the Lord had brought you to exactly where you are in life. Knowing that God's purpose for the universe is the salvation of his church, how should that shape your attitude and approach toward your co-workers, your family, and your neighbors?
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have sovereignly directed all of world history for the salvation of your people, the Church. Please help us to view our own lives and circumstances within your greater purposes, and give us grace to so live today that on that coming day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will have no cause for shame, but know only glory. In the name of Christ, amen.